most generous introduction. Excellencies, honored guests, fellow researchers, members of the governing board of the Human Rights Resource Center, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Salamat siya. I hope I got that right. And to our fellow friends, our friends who are fasting and praying today, Salamat ben kwasa. Ben kwasa. Thank you. It is my pleasure to present to you today a collection of findings of the researchers with expert advice from our advisors on the rule of law for human rights in Southeast Asia, Asia. This report is a collection of the work of all the researchers with advice from our dedicated and very able advisors. It is also my pleasure to be and great honor to be surrounded by everybody here who I know is most eager to hear the findings and contribute to our discussion later. And um, it's okay. So, so I will add him first. So the report is a baseline study, not really a baseline study, but an update of the baseline study. A baseline study, as we all know, presents the current situation, situational report, using current indicators to identify starting points for programs, projects, and other interventions. I'd like to stress that this one takes off from a framework that was used by the previous study and updates the results of the previous study. As mentioned earlier, it is not my entire undertaking, but the work and collective effort of all the country reporters, some of whom are here today. By country practice, we mean legislative changes legislative changes that have taken and shaped the rule of law in the last five years. This is very important because we are undertaking ASEAN integration. This baseline study, update on the rule of law, is primarily legal, but it also includes That's reflected in your uh, book, in the book that you have. It is legal, it focuses on legislative reform in ASEAN states. So the approach is legal. However, I would like to also stress that in the reports that you have, especially in the country reports, there is a short discussion on the history of the evolution of the rule of law in each of the reports. So I would also like to state, as a beginning point, that the discussion is about breadth. It is a collection of legislative frameworks, and the purpose is really, because this is a baseline study, the purpose is really to enhance the deliberative process for further thinking about the rule of law for human rights. We want to have changes, and we want to contribute to the changes, positively. I hope that the state of the law in ASEAN states will spark studies and research on multiple dimensions and perspectives including the context within which the rule of law operates. Because this one is a benchmark or a launch pad for further studies. I would like to begin by, by saying what questions did we ask ourselves? How did we approach the problem? This is the, um, the 
two, two study questions that we have here. First is, the main one is really how the ASEAN states, do the individual ASEAN states, I mean, do they uphold commitment to establish and maintain rule of law? These questions are also taken from the original baseline study. Second is, to answer the first question, what legislative changes had taken place in the ASEAN member states in the last years? Do they support or detract from ASEAN's vision of a rules-based society? The structure of the report, as you will see in the book that you have, the country reports are based, they have uh, four parts, and the synthesis next, tries to have key observations in relation to country practices on the rule of law for human rights, and then it makes a relationship or tries to draw a relationship between those practices and the integration the integration into a rules-based society, community, in the ASEAN. Okay, before I proceed to what we have found so far, I'd like to just quickly run down, make a run-through of what we mean by an overview of human rights, rule of law. Faith has mentioned this one earlier, so that we will just be guided on the framework within which we approach the rule of law. The original study has chosen the UN definition for approaching the rule of law. I'd like to stress that uh, this one puts emphasis on the principle of governance. So it's state things. Next. And um, According to literature, the UN definition is based on the core principles or the pillars of modern society's legal system. And the pillars are human rights law, humanitarian law, criminal law, and refugee law. And we, when we look at that, we will compare it to the ASEAN commitments to some particular treaties relating to these bodies of law. So we have here a chart showing ASEAN states and the instruments that they have signed, ratified, or acceded to. As we can see, all ASEAN states have signed, for example, or are parties to the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Then I would like to make a discussion, and this one was made by the previous report, on what ASEAN states mean by rule of law. This is very important, and I'd like to stress this, because rule of law is and has, sev it has several definitions. And we can see that in the legislature and in the laws of the ASEAN states, they have tried to somehow ascertain what rule of law means. And I, I, I am, uh, I've tried to group the definitions according to some strands. The first strand is what I call a definition using an institutional approach. This one highlights institutional attributes that are necessary to realize or activate rule of law. For instance, the jurisprudential definition rule of law in Singapore proposes in a nutshell a fundamental it is a fundamental principle the foundation on which Singapore was built and a framework for proper functioning. No power could be exercised unchecked and judicial review is the cornerstone. Thanks. Next category which I like to call ends based approaches. This one puts emphasis on the ends that the rule of law is intended to serve within society. Cambodia, for instance, uh, regards the rule of law as part of a cluster of other values and principles 
to achieve democracy, human rights, justice, good governance, social order, and respect of the law. And then, based on the literature, we also have a definition that is ideal, ideologically based. They call it the Socialist School of Law. And Vietnam um, illustrates this one. There are key principles. Supremacy of the Constitution and the law. Equality of all peoples before the law. Respect of human rights as well as community values. Significance of the social order and democratic centralization of state powers. And there, and we have found that there are states in transition which do not really clearly lay out the meanings of rule of law in their states. So faith has uh, mentioned this one earlier, that the rule of law is in the ASEAN Charter. The rule of law is also found in the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, it reaffirms the definition, sorry, the, um, the mention in the ASEAN Charter. And so, with that preface, I'd like now to present to you what we have found so far in the last five years on, on based on the central principles of uh, rule of law for human rights. This is also, again, the take-off point from the, of the particular earlier study. The central principle, the first central principle means that it, it states that the laws, sorry, the government and its officials are accountable under the law. It's about accountability under the law of public officials. We have found so far a continuing trend in reports on the lack of separation of powers in some states. For example, Brunei. The absence of separation of powers in states is exemplified by the executive powers and legislative powers vested upon the Sultan. He has prerogative powers and jurisdiction. We also found that there's still a continuing state of emergency and he has discretion to issue orders as long as deemed to be desirable in the public interest. I'd also like to point out that this is quite interesting that the Sharia Penal Code of 2003 is a challenge. It states that any person who contempts, neglects, contravenes, opposes, or insults a decree shall be, shall be imprisoned for up to five, five years. And so there can be a problem of whether there is a room for checks and balances and whether there is a room for dissent in society. Next one which I'd like to highlight is there are some problems of, with judicial review including immunity. Vietnam's constitution provides judicial review, and that's most admirable. However, according to our report, there's still no independent institutional body to actually conduct judicial review. Judicial review is most important because judicial review allows the, a mechanism where the state can check actions of one government body and then can declare them to be unconstitutional or invalid. Um, what's commendable is that, for example, the Constitution of Laos, there's a new change in 2015, clarified roles and mandates of government bodies. However, it was pointed out at the same breath that some in the legislature can enjoy immunity from all criminal prosecution. Uh, Myanmar's, uh, Myanmar 2016, just this year, passed a former president's security law. Uh, it's an immunity law. Um, the problem of judicial review, however, is, is also present in 
for example, in Thailand, uh, the National Council for Peace and Order conferred powers on prevention and suppression officers of the army. I'd like to point out that I'm just giving illustrations because I cannot uh, basically run through all the indicators because they're a lot. Uh, under, each, uh, under each particular central principle, we have a lot of indicators. And uh, they're all in the book. I'd like to continue now. Uh, there was a concern about the extra-constitutional partial cancellation of the fundamental law. And this one, as we know, uh, happened in when the 2007 Constitution of Thailand was quote, partially, partly cancelled by the Kupta after the coup in 2014. Okay? This is in sharp contrast, I'd say, to the regime of law that governs other states, wherein we have constitutions that were amended or changed using established rules. And in the rule of law society, it's, a, it's very important that we follow rules. And uh, we see that particular contradiction in us. For example, um, some commendable steps were Vietnam in 2013, Laos in 2015, and there are rules-based amendments in Cambodia, Singapore, and Myanmar. However, I'd also like to point out that there are some very important steps taken by ASEAN states in the promulgation of anti-corruption laws. And this one has to relate to accountability. Um, this is, these are all the rundown of the laws that were uh, crafted and promulgated that relate to anti-corruption efforts. Very recently, in Cuba, you will see that uh, the laws expand from, I mean, their, the span is from 2012, 2011, up to 2015. So we see a conscious effort of the ASEAN states to really handle the problem and deal with corruption. Yes. I move on now to the next central principle. Laws and procedure for arrest, detention, and punishment are publicly available lawful and not arbitrary. Arbitrariness is the antithesis of the rule of law. And when the laws are published and made available to people in a meaningful, intelligent manner, that means they can abide and follow the rules of law because they know the content of the laws. And so we know very positively, and this one really is very positive, the publication of, uh, of laws online by Lao PDR. Lao PDR has an official cassette that was launched online in 2013. Uh, this is uh, uh, mandated by the law and legislation. And also, uh, in, 2000, in the 2011 baseline report, uh, it said that there were plans to, for Singapore to have a portal on subsidiary legislations. This portal had been launched already, so that those are positive developments. However, I'd like to note that there's some sense of unpredictability and inconsistency in some critical laws. Okay. And the endangerment of the, these uh, the unpredictability and inconsistency goes really against the predictability that uh, the rule of law brings and consistency. We've seen that corruption and the politicization of things are contributing factors. For instance, in Laos, uh, the report mentioned that the complexity and lack of understanding of the law sometimes make people uh, you know, unpredictably or inconsistently follow law. In Myanmar, uh, there was a note that concerned that there was non-republication of pre-independence laws and access becomes a problem. Okay. The continued occurrence or outlawing of arbitrary arrest and detention was no trend. And this was very positive. 
Because it means all across ASEAN. It means all across ASEAN, they, the legal frameworks provide that arbitrary arrest and detention cannot just happen generally. And this is a general rule. General. Okay. And also, there are provisions in every law, as in the regime of laws, that provide for the rights of the accused. So all, all the accused persons have rights under the Constitution and the law of ASEAN. Brunei has, it has that particular one in the law, others are provided in the Constitution. So then what happens now? There is, we found a mixed positive and negative changes, there are mixed and positive changes rather, affecting the rights of the accused. And I'd like to first begin with the positive developments. Uh, positive developments. In 2012, there was an insertion in Laos law, in Lao law uh, on criminal procedure that detention of a person requires an order of the authorities. So a person cannot just be detained, an order of the authorities has to first be secured, and that's positive. Uh, the 2015 Constitution provides for the right to lives, bodies, honors, and houses. In Singapore, noted positively, the Misuse of Drugs Act, amended in 2012, removed mandatory death penalties. In 2013, we see continuing guarantees, and this is from the Constitution, of all subsisting rights of the accused. Some negative changes, however, should be pointed out as well. In Malaysia, there was a deep concern by the country rapporteur that Certain laws allow detention without trial outside a genuine state of emergency. This one has to deal with the Prevention of Terrorism Act 2015 and the amendments to an earlier law, the Prevention of Crime Act. In Myanmar, uh, there was a concern of arrest of violators of the law of peaceful assembly and peaceful procession. In Thailand, uh, the they have an interim constitution which brought in the authority and the power to crush political dissents with arrest and awareness. Actually, the interesting point here is that all the orders are considered lawful and final. So you have a problem again of, uh, problem again of judicial review. And uh, public discussions about the interim the uh, Constitution are largely prohibited. Okay. What do we see here? I see here probably a trend that there is an empowerment of the police state, and sometimes it can be due to the unbridled delegation to the authorities and actions that are their freedom. And this can probably cause this empowerment to people. I'd like to move on now and probably just briefly state some others, uh, other rights state uh, issues. And this one I really found quite uh, interesting because in Brunei, the accused is not presumed innocent and that denied the right to counsel under the Internal Security Act. We move on now to the third central principle, the process by which the laws are enacted and enforced is accessible, fair, efficient, and equally applied. We also note some positive and negative developments on access to law enforcement. First one is law enforcement. Uh, sorry, law enactment, sorry. In Myanmar, it's uh, very crucial that the uh, enactment of the laws are open and there's a deliberation process and people are informed about it. They have access to it, they have a stake, they have a say on things. And we see, for example, in Myanmar, draft laws are now announced publicly in major in the government newspaper since 2012. And this is really an enlightening time for, for, for them. Uh, in Cambodia, there is a circular prohibiting commissions of the National Assembly for you know, inviting